So looking at our participant list, doesn't look as though we've had anybody uh, joining for the last minute. We'll take that as our cue to begin. Um, so my friends, I am Susie DeLine. I'm with the Intel Alumni Network Committee, which I have to give full props as being a very entertaining group to reminisce, to come up with ideas of good topics to talk about. Um, obviously, we have a very interesting topic for today, but before we dive into that, I wanted to give you a preview of some upcoming events. Um, given that we've had to be virtual, it does make it easier for us to schedule and hold events. Thank you, Zoom. So um, in August, we're still setting the date, but it will be towards the end of the month. Um, we will have one of our esteemed alumni, Cliff Perkheiser, talking about his decision to be on a volunteer board um, for a nonprofit that he feels very deeply about. So we've got that upcoming in August. In September, we'll be having another look into some of the exciting new startups that Next Leap Ventures is looking to put out into the world. Again, we'll have more details on these over the Facebook page. Uh, you'll get emails and other, um, other updates about that. And then hoping that you can all see we've got the opportunity to support Intel Alumni Network. And I know every group that you belong to is certainly asking you for funding and support. But since we're all here, since uh, this event, this group does have some small expenses, I am going to put uh, into the chat link for everyone uh, a link where if you are so moved, you can support the, uh, the alumni organization. It's a PayPal link. Oh, goodness. Well, it is a PayPal link that did not copy properly. So let me put the actual link. So hopefully, if you are moved and wish to support the Intel Alumni Network, you can do so. Now, my friends, I am going to do a, a check down and turn off people's videos so that we can focus on the people who are presenting today, Ting Wei and Jeep Klein. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please do put them in the chat. We are going to periodically stop, look for questions and guide the discussion that way. Um, I believe our organizers are able to stay as long as we're having discussions. So we will be using the chat pane for that. You are muted, but you can raise your hand, you can leave comments, and we will try and make the discussion interactive in that way. All right, with that in mind, I am now turning the baton over to Jeep, making her the host. She will kick us off with a poll and then share her information. So Jeep and Tingwei, take it away. Excellent, thank you and hi everyone. I'm Jeep Klein, so let me- Do you want me to start? Yep, let me okay. um, see. Um, uh, I'm the host now, so let me do a quick sharing. So um, please uh, kick it off. Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Tingwei Huang. I joined Intel in 2010, and I just left in January of this year. So I've been at Intel for a total um, about nine or ten years. Um, during that time, I spent most of my time in the uh, data center group. Um, I'm now working at Amazon Web Service and I'm leading the product management for some of Amazon's AI services. Uh, today we will have an informal conversation. We intend to keep it informal um, and casual and more um, interaction. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about um, uh, the Southeast Asia with Jeep Klein, who is also an Intel alumni. Uh, Jeep has extensive operating experience in uh, technology and international business development. She was an economist at the World Bank, where she implemented technology projects to reduce poverty in many countries in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and Eastern Europe. And later, she joined Intel and created the company's first Android tablet, 
targeting the emerging markets. The product has since grown into a global portfolio in four years. After Intel, she served as COO at an early stage startup. She launched um, an edge, uh, edge computing and computer vision products worldwide. Uh, she has also been selected as key advisors on um, the investment committee at many top tier incubator programs, including the Sky, Sky Deck of uh, UC Berkeley, the Alchemist Accelerators and UCSF Health Hub. Um, she's an advisor to many startup CEOs and she, uh, she's also nominated to be the lead ambassador representing Skydeck at UC Berkeley in 11 countries in Southeast Asia. So most recently she became the co-founder and general partner at Translational Partners, which is a venture fund. And then uh, last but not least, she's also a board member of the Intel Alumni Network. So let's welcome Jeep. And uh, uh, I wanna say a little bit about um, the format and um, today. So we will start with, uh, I think G present, uh, prepare some slides, which is, you know, not, not a lot, um, just uh, four slides. Um, we'll go through, use the slides kind of as a backdrop as we um, proceed our conversations and Q and A's. And um, we will accept questions in the chat box um, along the way. And then in the end, you know, once we kind of, um, if we have some time left, um, we can stay, both Chief and I can stay, and we want to kind of create a virtual networking experience, hopefully through Zoom as well. So um, in the end, we hope we will have some time to open the floor um, for the audience to, um, you know, chat um, directly with Jeep and myself as well, and each other. Okay, so we're very excited here for this virtual uh, Intel Alumni Network event. And uh, one more thing, uh, this is especially special for us and for Jeep um, because today is his birth is our birthday. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. One year younger. Happy yeah. birthday. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so let's start. Um, Jeep, you want to fire up with some poll questions? Absolutely, and um, feel free to ask, you know, um, questions all along. Um, it's supposed to be fireside chat. Since we are doing virtual, um, I thought, you know, maybe I would tee up at least some slides, and then, um, I'm, you know, uh, we are welcome any questions. So before we get started um, about exciting, interesting um, journey um, that I have embarked on in the past few years, um, I would like to do a quick poll. Um, two poll questions. So I'll give you about 10 seconds to fill in and um, we'll get started. Let me know if you don't see um, on your screen. All right, two more seconds and then very interesting. All right, I would like to um, share uh, the results with you. Of course, you know, um, you know, most of us are here in North America, uh, in North America due to, uh, you know, the time zone difference. And um, I'm happy that, you know, those of you who are in Asia, uh, I bet it's like 2 or 3 a.m. in the morning. So thank you for joining us. Um, and the majority of us have done business um, to a certain extent in Southeast Asia before. So, uh, you know, I'm wow. happy to share um, deeper perspectives um, and, you know, um, key lessons um, uh, that I've learned um, in the past year. So uh, why don't we, um, so I'm gonna close uh, the poll right now. Let's get started on this. Um, yeah, maybe let me, let me, yeah. let me, let me start. Yeah, so um, I prepared some questions and you, you can um, drive the slide as you see fit. Okay, so I think um, the first is uh, the audience and, and, and also, you know, for the last almost 10 years I've known you, um, we're, we're all um, very um, 
you know, impressed and um, interested into your kind of the diversities of the backgrounds that you've had. So can you tell us a little bit about your journey? And, you know, we heard earlier on that yeah. you had um, uh, worked at World Bank and then went to Intel and then to startup and now becoming um, a venture capitalist. Um, so how do each of these experiences influence you in what you do today? Yeah, that's, um, that's a great question. You know, um, it sounded like I uh, jumped around and moved quite a bit um, from uh, industry to industry. And uh, my background and training, I was trained as an economist. Um, and um, that's why I started my career. Um, my first, uh, uh, first job at the World Bank um, in Washington, D.C. as an economist. Um, and then, you know, um, the theme, you know, even though it sounds like I have worked at the World Bank, then I moved to a big enterprise company, which is a global company like Intel, and then, um, and then ran um, a startup, early stage startup, and then um, also morph into uh, become an advisor um, to CEOs and different incubation programs. And I looked back into my career, and there is one single theme that is the uh, that underpins, you know, my choice. And that is economic development. Um, whatever I do, um, I always thought about how the product, the company, or the business that I created or advice can, impl can impact uh, globally. Even when I was at Intel, um, I uh, created um, one of the first Android-based low-cost um, tablet business that really um, served uh, emerging markets. That was a core market that you know I was attracted to. Um, when I'm doing advisory uh, work um, to the startup, I always you know um, ask them to think about you know how your business and product um, can scale globally. Not now, but do you have a line of sight to that? And those are the kind of thing that has been attractive to me. Um, so most recently, um, I founded Translational Venture, um, which is uh, a venture capital fund, but it's a little bit different from the, the mainstream VC, uh, um, especially in the Bay Area, because, um, you know, maybe I can also uh, um, dive um, into um, the slides here. Um, the, the mission of the fund is, uh, it was born from the fact that I saw the disparities, you know, you can call it income disparities, um, um, in the Bay Area. Um, in the past 10 years, those of you, especially those of you who are located here, know that there is a, the gap is um, getting bigger between the group of people who have access to technology and become a winner um, because uh, the company and business are very successful versus the people who didn't have the, the, the access to technology. And you can see that um, the disparity getting wider and wider. And this phenomenon is actually not just, it's not just about the Bay Area. It's not just within the US. And it also happened all around the world. And since I'm uh, from Southeast Asia, I'm from Thailand originally, um, and I've spent decades um, of my career here in the US, I can see that you know, people, and especially the, the enterprise, you know, the government, you know, try to get access to um, technology and um, create, create prosperity for the nation. So um, it's also because of the timing that was uh, quite right. So if you look um, at the map here, you know, there are early winners across um, the, the world. You know, China has successfully created its own te technology ecosystem and industry, whether that may be, you know, Shenzhen, Shanghai, Beijing and whatnot. Israel, to a certain ex extent, growing really, really fast and focus on technology. Um, of course, Taiwan, um, Singapore um, is the government um, pushed very strongly to really grow the tech ecosystem. It, um, the, the government wants the country to be the hub, you know, not just a financial, um, international financial hub for Southeast Asia, but also want to be a technology hub. And of course, we can talk more about that, you know. Um, last year, com you know, the government competes very um, aggressively with Hong Kong and the like, you know, on who attracts the best of startups into, um, into the country. Um, and, you know, these are the, the condition is kind of ripe for me to think that it is the right time for Southeast Asia to really benefit from linking um, themselves 
to Silicon Valley or some other technology hub in, um, across the U.S. Could be Seattle, could be Boston, and other areas as well. So um, what I've done in the last year, so to answer kind of the, the, you know, um, your, your question in a long way, in the last year, um, I flew you know, um, to different countries in Southeast Asia, uh, speaking with uh, business leaders, CEOs, um, the top government officials, just to learn what they really want to accomplish and how we can serve them and how we create strategic linkages between the two regions. Great. Um, so I think you talk about um, uh, Southeast, you know, what, what brings you to Southeast Asia and you definitely have the roots there. Um, so what do you do specifically in Southeast Asia and uh, also um, uh, today and what's so special about Southeast Asia? Can you say more about that? Yeah. Um, so when I think about Southeast Asia, another way to think about it is they, they are hungry. Okay. They know that they are behind China. They used to be ahead of China, say, 20, 30 years ago. Right now, they are behind in terms of technology access and ecosystem development and, in, you know, um, and economic development at large in terms of growth. Um, um, they, um, they know that they have somewhat, you know, um, um, also follow India um, in a certain um, aspect in terms of uh, engineering, technology talents, but most importantly, they realize that they are getting disrupted um, by the growth of the technology. Um, so if you, um, when, when it went, um, you know, uh, so let me back up a little bit. So I went there with open-minded. So I talked to, I met with, you know, I call them so-called top 10 uh, families who own a lot of uh, businesses, like large enterprise businesses, um, that is handed over the generations. The business could, you know, created by their grandparents or parents, and then they inherit it, and they know they are getting disrupted. I talked to uh, the government official um, in the subject of, you know, how they can create um, their own technology ecosystem. Do they need, you know, would they need like 40 or 50 years like Silicon Valley that, you know, that we have? How they can create a shortcut, a shortcut and learn the experience that we have here. Um, so it's quite interesting to hear the perspective, right? Because they know that their business ultimately is not going to be sustainable. For example, um, in a hotel business, they know that Airbnb is coming. Uh, their large uh, business um, is getting disrupted. They want to know how they can prevent this disruption. You know, whether that may be transportation, e-commerce, healthcare, telecommunications, and you can name it. But they don't know what they need to do to prevent the disruption or preempt the disruption so that they can maintain the market power and wealth that can be transferred over the generations. And honestly, that is what they care about. Now, the structure of the economy is quite different from, you know, in the US um, or in Europe, because there are a lot of powerful families that own large scale business, in some cases conglomerate, like food and agriculture, you know, down to retail and telecommunication. So um, they also know that they're not an inventor and they're not trying to be. So the best way that they can really learn fast um, before uh, getting disrupted is they have to link themselves with a the technology hub. And of course, uh, Silicon Valley or the US is one of the key places that they can learn, um, whether that may be direct investment in startups, whether that may be uh, investment through venture capital funds, so they can look broad and wide and see what are the new ideas that are happening um, that they can actually take it and, and also grow with it. So that is what interesting to me in a nutshell. So when I think about Southeast Asia, it's almost like Silicon Valley, you know, 30 years ago, that it's, you know, trying to grow and create its own ecosystem. That's very interesting. Uh, I just want to remind the audience, uh, you're free to um, submit any questions in the chat box um, anytime you want, and I can uh, look at them and curate them and, um, um, you know, ask them 
you know, during this uh, presentation as well. Okay. So, um, so you mentioned the top 10 family. That sounds uh, kind of really <laughs> mysterious. So can you elaborate um, more about who they are, um, what kind of industry they're in, or they're interested in investing? Yeah, absolutely. So it, it is, you know, um, it, it's not like a formal name or anything. So um, we kind of so call them, you know, in different um, countries like the Philippines, like the Thailand, there is, uh, you know, a top powerful families that control big, you know, um, assets and wealth that is uh, so significant that you can count it as a share of GDP. Okay. Mm. And it has been that way over the generation and the wealth is inherited. And it's not um, um, the, the way that um, it is different from the US is the wealth is also inherited. But in Asia, you know, they would ask their sons, the daughters, or the siblings um, to become a CEO of the portfolio of companies within the conglomerate, or, you know, um, they have to integrate themselves in a management team. Okay, so not only, you know, they have wealth um, that um, their family created, they have to run the company as well. Now, what I've observed um, in this respect as well that the company that is managing really well and grow over time usually is a good blend um, between the family members and also professional managers. You know, there are professional CEOs, um, C-level executives, and then there might be some family members who sit on a board and then they learn and transfer no knowledge between, you know, so, sort of like the founder families as well as the new, you know, professional managers, and then they work together to really grow the company. Um, and these uh, top families, um, they, um, you know, usually when you look in, in each industry, for example, agriculture, um, agriculture and food, which is, you know, one of the largest um, in each country um, in Southeast Asia, usually there is one or two uh, families who own the conglomerate. That is the majority or the market leader is a clear market leader in each um, sector um, of those industries. And it's the same as um, hotel and retail and um, telecommunication. So each family are the market leaders in each sector. And um, strikingly, what I've also discovered is the structure of these um, type of, you know, um, um, e economic and, uh, and power um, it's very similar between Thailand, um, uh, Malaysia, and the Philippines. Certain extent, um, Indonesia. Singapore is, is quite an exception that, you know, there are also a lot of family-owned um, businesses and also inheritance, but, you know, they are managed to become more internationalized than the rest of the countries within the region. So, um, since the wealth is pretty much um, congregated within, you know, the top families, um, the way to do business is, you know, um, these are the target to do business with in each um, different sector. But most importantly, the ties between the private sector and uh, the public sector is also very crucial. Okay, so if you think about in the Bay Area or technology industry here, of course, you know, we we know, we learn a lot about the government, the policy, the influence, or, you know, right now, you know, there is also um, debate in Congress and whatnot. But in Asia, the partnership actually happens since day one. They can, it's very hard to get things done without the government support. So um, the, 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 the partnership or the tight bonds between the, the, the families and the government <coughs> are also there. So um, I'm just gonna pause here because I know that I throw a lot of information um, and you know, by answering your question, just mm -hmm. you know, um, in case you uh, would like to ask some questions, otherwise I can also um, go on. This is, this is Susie jumping in. Um, I'm just housekeeping wise, if I I'm gonna admit a few people who are waiting in the waiting room, and I will ask if people, when you come in, do a double check and see that you can mute yourself and uh, turn off your video because we've had a few people cough and 
not that it's not nice to see you when you cough, but it's just nice to take a check and to put yourself on mute and on video, which is supposed to be the default with Zoom, but Zoom has been um, adventurous today. So once we do a check that way, and now um, we are able to see um, there are some questions in the polling, and I am resetting up. Yet uh, we're having a bit of Zoom is having a bit of an issue today with being able to chat to everyone, which is usually a feature. And there we go. It should be reset. So if people now want to put in questions, they should be seen broadly, and Tingwei will curate them. Okay. Okay. There I we go. I haven't been able to see them. I uh, there was a there was a setting that was okay. not the default setting, but now it is the default setting. So uh, with that being said, I am putting myself back off of the host, um, and I believe I am giving um, both Tingwei and Jeep the ability to forward the slides, and we should be able to carry on. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Thank Susie. You. Okay, so um, Jeep, you mentioned about the nature of, you know, like in, in the Southeast Asia, the, the business environments is largely driven by um, few uh, family businesses or conglomerates. And also the fact that a lot of these um, these families are have also strong ties with governments, and in order to get things done, we will have to um, be partner with the government um, um, from day one. So, is there any other kind of uh, tips or things that um, you know for folks who are interested in uh, doing business in Southeast Asia or investing in Southeast Asia or bringing investment um, um, fund from Southeast Asia um, to other parts of the world um, we should be paying attention to? No, absolutely. You know, I think that first thing is to really understand the structure of the economy. You know, um, part of it is, is what we have covered in terms of the relationship between private and, and public sector, who to go to, you know, why um, family uh, or top 10, you know, uh, families are, are very important because they drive um, significant, you know, um, 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 power and um, also, you know, the management and policy uh, within each um, country. I think it's also important to, you know, um, before doing um, the business, um, I think it's important to really understand what they are looking for. Um, when I asked, you know, um, or interview the, uh, the biggest companies, uh, you know, uh, in, in each country and also the board members, you know, I asked them, what do they want from Silicon Valley? You know, it's, it's really a hype right now that everybody want to invest in startups. Everybody wants some sort of access um, through venture capital and whatnot. So they were actually, quite surprisingly, they are not mentioning anything about financial returns which is, you know, probably one of the, you know, top on the list when you talk to investors um, in the U.S. or maybe in Silicon Valley, they look at the return, they look at the scale, they look at, you know, um, a lot of criteria we have heard about. They're actually at the very starting point. That's why I think it's very exciting. They're thinking about, you know, what they call technology transfer. And what it is, is then look at China as a role model. They look at China and said, hey, you know, 15, 10 years ago, China didn't have, you know, uh, China didn't yet have a large um, technology ecosystem. How can they become one? Um, and China essentially what it did was it links itself uh, with Silicon Valley, you know, through investment in startup, um, through training, um, education and talents. Uh, invest in venture capital funds to learn about the portfolio company on what are the new um, ideas and R&D um, that is applicable to the country and then bring it back um, and then scale and then build its own ecosystem. So what they are looking right now is want, they want to learn about the technology. They want to hear about R&D. Can they take it, adapt it, um, localize it? and scale among all the uh, 11 nations first before you know, um, going further than that. The market itself in Southeast Asia is huge. Um, you know, for example, in terms of population alone is 
over half a billion population. So it's not a small market. But whether it is as developed or sophisticated as in the US, it depends on what, you know, on, on what technology. Definitely there are, you know, huge technology um, consumers there. So they want to learn and they're hungry to learn and they want to do it fast and they want to scale uh, when they're ready. Whether that may be, you know, production process. For example, I talked to um, um, the largest uh, food um, and agricultural company that has expanded into huge conglomerate. And the founder, the chairman and a founder at one point actually came to the Convalley. And he said, you know, um, he founded a company, you know, more than uh, 50 years ago. He's the first generation. Um, right now, the second gen generation is managing um, the company. Um, and there is now food tech beyond meat, you know, uh, Impossible Burger. How can they do this too? In a way that it's adjusted locally and create the process that replicate and scalable. Just to give you an example, but there are a ton of example, healthcare, tourism, which got hit pretty hard right now because of COVID, because, you know, um, people who can't travel. So they are thinking about what else can they do? So there are a lot of things that they can do now instead of waiting um, to see the financial return maybe five or 10 years down the road. So Jeep, um, since you mentioned, you know, a lot of the, <clears throat> the companies in Southeast Asia are interested in technology transfer. Um, what's your view on the IP right if the US company, has it been an issue um, what's your general sentiment there? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a great question. So when they're talking about IP, it's not like they want to, you know, um, um, their view is they want to take the IP and technology by doing the partnership, doing it right, and see whether or not they can adapt and implement on their own. And this is how the investment, if they're going to link themselves with a the startup, invest directly in startup or partner with big companies, whether or not they can do that. They don't want to take the IP and replicate it and, and copy it in a way that, you know, it's not localized or beneficial to the local market. Um, what they're more interested in is actually, you know, the ideas and the talent. They know, you know, if you look into, if you, if you look at the ed education rate um, and the engineers um, that the, the 11 countries in, the, um, in Southeast Asia have produced is actually quite significant, even in Vietnam, in Thailand, of course, Singapore. Um, they want to know how the engineers here can help train the engineers there in terms of implementation. The engineers there, they were very, very smart and educated, um, but they also need catalysts so that they can work in team. Um, and I think that's what they were most interested in. So would that be a risk for U.S. company who are interested in working with uh, Southeast Asia partners today? Um, given, you know, it seems like they just want to, act, they want to access the R&Ds and the technology, but they really want to re-implement it over there with their own um, engineers and resource over there over time. Yeah, so I think that um, most of the companies that I've talked to, they, re re they respect um, the, you know, international laws and IP don't want to do it right. Um, what they actually care more about is whether or not the technology that they're going to bring in is going to be directly implementable. Is it too early? Is it too late? Um, I think that's more of the discussion around it uh, more than the IP itself. I think it's the idea um, the applications, you know, just to give you a specific, um, some specific example. So there was one company um, that um, I introduced um, to, uh, to a large, um, um, I call them, you know, um, uh, food conglomerate. Um, this is, this is um, more like food and, you know, CPG, consumer packaged goods. They're also doing like lotion and a lot of other things. Um, and it's a fourth um, generation management which also blends really well, you know, uh, with professional managers. So what they're interested in is, you know, um, they know that um, this um, startup has an IP in terms of supply chain implementation. You know, it is about um, how they can really implement the technology to help um, C-level executives and managers um, to make a better decision and increase the eff effective effectiveness and efficiency of com communications within an organization. Mm -hmm. So those are um, the type of um, 
technology deployment that they see that it can create impact immediately and save costs. And, you know, hopefully would uh, improve the top line. These are some of the examples that I've seen. Um, it involves IP. Um, they do it, um, implement it in a similar manner that the startup wanted to scale with customers in the US. And I think that's one of the beauty, um, you know, um, in um, Singapore and Thailand and these countries that they do respect um, um, the IP um, and also uh, respect international law. Great. Um, I would, yeah, I, I would also like to, you know, add um, to, you know, what you asked on, you know, uh, what, what I, uh, when I went there, you know, what I've learned and what surprised me. And I thought this would be also interesting uh, to uh, our uh, Intel audience. Here. Yeah, I think it would be interesting, but I think there are a few questions here. Um, I think um, I, I want to make sure because there are a few people want to understand more about actually your yeah. fund. Um, oh, yes. So um, uh, I think the questions are around um, what are your investment thesis? How has it been or has it been um, influenced by your experience at Intel? Um, and uh, is your fund still open? What a size of your fund? I think we got maybe some investors in the audience who would want to see, you know, if uh, they can invest in your fund. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Absolutely. You know, um, my journey last year is to really uh, understand uh, what Southeast Asia is uh, looking for, uh, creating um, collaboration and partnership with, um, you know, uh, the government and also uh, the top families and um, the corporate enterprise um, um, at, at, a, at a larger scale. Um, my fund currently is is you know trying to create the strategic linkages by uh, bringing some of the promising entrepreneurs and startup to incubate here, and that's how they get to learn. Um, we also bring some startup, as I mentioned, and introduce them to the enterprise there. So uh, this uh, is not yet the fund that you know uh, would um, invest directly in startup because you know right now we are um, in the in the you know pandemic and um, the travel is quite limited. It could be something that I would you know um, consider doing in in the future. But right now I see that the market needs to learn first on you know what benefit they would take they would get from linking themselves very closely with the U.S., especially Silicon Valley. And I can talk more about the mission of the fund. Uh, what sector that, you know, uh, we are looking at, uh, what sector are the most um, important and impactful in Southeast, that is related to Southeast Asia economy. Yeah, why don't you, can you talk about a little bit about that? I think folks yeah. are really interesting. Oh, absolutely. So um, the topic, you know, um, the interest, um, the large interest would come from uh, um, a couple of uh, sectors. And it's quite similar uh, um, across the country, the Philippines, Malaysia, um, Thailand, Indonesia, and Singapore. And certain again. So one definitely is fintech. You know, financial and banking system has been largely, you know, um, dominated by uh, a, a few families. Um, and currently, you know, in the Philippines, you know, it's in some cases, it's third generation, um, second and fourth generation, depending on the bank. And there are one or two large family dominating that sector, similar to Thailand, one or two families. In Singapore, it's a, a little bit more diverse. Um, so FinTech um, is, is very critical uh, and very, very important. Food and agriculture, I mean, this is undeniable. And, and food and agriculture business has grown so much um, and expand into retail. Uh, and telecommunication because they want to own all the supply chain, you know, from um, farming um, to how the products actually get delivered um, into customers' hands. So along the way, um, that is um, the entire process that um, is largely owned by, you know, uh, a few uh, large companies. And of course, there are a lot of small and medium businesses but um, those are not, um, you know, um, as large as, you know, the one on the top. Um, the third, of course, um, tourism, tourism and uh, services. Uh, uh, Southeast Asia re region, in fact, um, 
is known uh, for uh, being one of the destinations, you know, that uh, people uh, like to travel to. So when you see the hotels there, um, uh, you will notice that it's a more like boutique hotel chain, uh, which usually owned also, you know, um, by the enterprise um, conglomerate. And right now, um, this industry is in, is being impacted very uh, severely due to due to the pandemic. So they kind of, you know, um, uh, in some cases, they get in self, themselves into more like retail and services and restaurant and food delivery businesses to really, um, you know, um, expand outside the core. So these are some of the, you know, and, and one of the new things that I've learned as well, is actually healthcare, which I'm very surprised by it. Because, you know, um, in the past, healthcare is basically two, the sector is basically, you know, two system. One is, you know, public healthcare, which is like public hospital, and another is private healthcare, which is, you know, you pay out of pocket, right? And right now, um, there is um, some sort of consolidation that I've learned in the last few years that, um, you know, a group of private hospitals um, is owned, you know, by, by an enterprise. So when you go to this ho private hospital, uh, hospital A and hospital B that you don't think they're related, right now they're actually grouped together to really you know, uh, manage and drive the cost down for the private um, healthcare system. And that has been ongoing. And this group, I call it more like a, an, an incoming or newcomer because this is something that I didn't expect to see, but they were actually really, um, how, how do how what were more, more like liberal in, in terms of they're hungry for the technology because they because they know you know when the CEO who's the private enterprise manage the company they know that they can actually uh, encourage um, doctors and nurses to look at the new devices new technology and implement it you know um, uh, much easier when they don't have to rely on the system or insurance or you know a lot of a lot of partners that are sometimes um, um, limited um, to to the implementation. So these are the top sectors that you know are the key to the economy and um, usually manage and run uh, by by um, professional CEO and also um, top ten families. Mm -hmm. um the question there's a questions um, from audience on um, what do you think what are the advantage and disadvantage of these um, mega families um, you know kind of control or dominate the, um, the their economies um, in long term yeah you know this is not, um, not necessarily short term but more like the long term impact um, of that yeah you know um, is, this itself I, I, is a thesis <laughs> Yeah, I, I've been thinking about this um, quite a bit. Um, you know, uh, as an economist um, by training, um, the wealth or inequal income inequalities has been um, unequally distributed um, within a country, uh, among the uh, within the region, and um, this is why I think uh, technology access um, um, is very, very important. But, however, in order to get started to do business, you know, um, working with the key players um, is critical. Otherwise, it's going to be very hard to create an impact or the impact might not be as scalable um, as you would want. Um, and um, I, it, it's, it's the structure that cannot be changed um, um, immediately. But as people learn more about technology, you know, uh, Intel, when I worked, uh, when I was at Intel, um, the, the group of the customers who I serve um, in emerging markets are actually SMB. And they know, and you know that SMB is still the majority, altogether, they are the majority um, um, segment um, in each country in the economy, and they want to grow. So ability to give access um, of the technology uh, from, from the top, you know, and also in the middle and work with educational institutions, uh, which I also have met um, a number of universities throughout my journey as well, you know, um, to build um, new entrepreneurs and educate entrepreneurs, bring entrepreneurs here to incubate in this country or, you know, um, to raise funds and, and whatnot. These, I hope over time, 
you know, would um, start to close the gap. Um, but I don't think that, you know, uh, not working with the very top uh, would help. I think that it is that entire system that has to move forward. Um, and that's what we do. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jeep, um, we're looking at your slide here. Um, you, I, I, we noticed you yeah. also have some experience with China. There's some, uh -huh. uh, why don't you talk about a little bit about that? And then there are also some questions from the audience um, specifically regarding China as well. Um, I think folks yeah. like to see what's your opinion about um, the current political climates between uh, U.S. and China, and as well as the most recent events of China's policy on Hong Kong, and how have that or have that um, um, impact uh, the investment um, industries of the climates over there? Absolutely. Um, so um, I call this is the insight, you know, to summarize on what I've learned. That also surprised me. One of the questions that I've heard a lot. Um, you know, when I talked to, um, when I, when I was in Singapore and Thailand, you know, why Silicon Valley? China is closer. I can just invest in China. It's so developed right now. Everybody talk about culture that, you know, the, the Chinese, they work day and night. They work during the weekend. They can take the technology from, you know, one to 10, uh, in a week. Uh, Silicon Valley is outdated almost. They didn't say this word, but it sounded almost like, are you outdated? You know, you don't move fast anymore. Um, and it's, it's quite a surprise, you know, given that all of us, uh, most of us here in Silicon Valley and in the U.S. know that, you know, this is, you know, still U.S. is still the place um, that create uh, new technology, new R&D and new ideas, the original ideas um, that want to scale and move forward. So on the other hand, I, you know, I also think that investing or linking themselves um, uh, with Silicon Valley is, is not a competition with, with China. It's not an either or question. Can they do both? If you know, uh, they view as uh, China as you know, a place where there is a certain things that they would like to learn, maybe you know, making a hardware at a lower cost, um, maybe take advantage of a certain competitive advantage that a country has, you know, which is different from Silicon Valley, I think that is, you know, um, there's no limitation in terms of, you know, Silicon Valley versus China. Um, but, the, 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 but the question or the discussion came up quite a bit, almost like either or, almost like a competition, right? That is one of the insight or one of the key things that, that I've learned. Um, number two, uh, which I kind of mentioned a little bit that, you know, when they're talking about strategic linkages or investment, whether maybe directly um, uh, um, in a startup company or through venture capital funds, um, they care more about strategic returns. And what they mean by strategic return is, you know, can they pull in um, the best practice or uh, BKMs and apply and localize and, you know, make it work so that they can scale within the region before going, you know, before going to Europe or some other region. Um, they always mostly say that they don't um, care much about, you know, uh, financial returns um, unless there are financial institutions that only invest for pure financial returns. You know, um, for me, uh, when I look um, in Silicon Valley, there are a lot of investors uh, who invest for strategic return, not just financial return. And you can, you know, you can argue that um, some uh, venture capital arms uh, within the large enterprise um, really care more about what are uh, the technology that it can bring in uh, to a certain extent is Intel Capital, right? I mean, of course, they care about financial return, but they also want to invest um, strategically. So again, I, I don't think this is, um, you know, um, either or. I think that financial return um, is a minimum requirement. I don't think that people want to sacrifice and lose money, but when they invest, um, there should be sort of like a minimum criteria while getting to learn and getting to, to see the first view of what Silicon Valley can offer. And I think this is the opportunity for Intel alumni. Um, this is uh, the spatial note that I would you know, like to share. So everywhere you go in Southeast Asia, people know Intel. So the good news is you don't have to sort of explain yourself on what Intel actually does. 
And when you talk about Silicon Valley, people know that Silicon is, is Intel. Um, and there are a lot of um, opportunities uh, to, you know, whether that may be advisory, whether that may be knowledge, um, you know, um, transfer in terms of um, institution, um, speakers, uh, speakership, like courses, all those things that think about uh, people uh, who really want to learn um, what hardware is all about, what software it all, is all about, how they work together, how it can be applied. And Intel, to a, to a large extent, has done that because it's a global company. So I think it, this is really, really beneficial to us um, when um, you do business in Southeast Asia. The third thing that, you know, um, that I've heard quite a bit um, is, you know, when you talk to uh, investors, um, whether that may be a private enterprise or maybe, you know, family owned, or you know, um, um, large um, size of uh, business, um, uh, public enterprise, they would say um, they want to invest only the sector that they operate in. For example, you know, the food sector want to invest in food tech. Um, the financial sector, you know, the banking, they want to invest in fintech. Um, or um, the hotel, they want to invest in you know, um, hotel and, and services. They don't want to do, you know, why, why do they need to invest um, in, you know, um, a lot of sectors and look into a lot of sectors. And um, you can also argue that, you know, the disruption actually comes usually from outside sector. If you look at Uber and Airbnb, they are not taxi, they are not hotel company, but they were able to um, create a technology that really impact um, the, the mainstream um, industry. So if you just started out, um, and you want to learn, you want to learn broad and wide and look as much as possible, understand how the system works before, you know, going specific into one company, one startup company, or, you know, um, a handful of companies. So these are the, uh, the key things that I've learned based on, you know, a lot of meetings and discussions um, with, um, with these countries. Uh, what about the the questions about the China's, um, you know, kind of the impact of the political climate? Has that changed the uh, investment, um, uh, the investors' uh, mindset much recently? Um, you know, I'm, I'm actually, the, the current political climate, you know, including the, you know, the trade deal and, you know, what have you seen in the, it, it actually concerned me quite a bit. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned more about Silicon Valley than China. Um, a lot of, um, you know, uh, enterprise and um, in Southeast Asia and the government and um, businesses, they already look up to China. It's closer. They thought they were a fast mover. You know, um, if they have limited resource uh, in terms of financial resource or even human resource, they would want to go to China because it, you know, it, it makes sense to them more than to us. So what happened recently I am more concerned that, you know, this trend will continue and they would miss the opportunity to learn and take advantage of what we have to offer here in the U.S. and Silicon Valley specifically. Um, I, you know, it's, it's the only way to learn is to learn broad. I, I still, you know, um, uh, you know, I had uh, this discussion with, you know, um, uh, a family who, you know, wanted to really, uh, you, you know, don't want to come to Silicon Valley at all. And I was like, no, the, the core or the, the, the raw idea, the talents, if you look into the numbers of the VC investment, if you look into the number of entrepreneurs who incubate um, companies and products, even though they were from outside uh, California, maybe Boston, Cambridge, um, Seattle, some of them still move here because this is the cluster it's already an agglomerate of the technology industry. So, so you, you don't want to miss that. Okay, so I think we have a few minutes left, but we're almost at the top of the hour. Um, I would like to open the floor 
um, for folks to have more direct interactions with uh, Jeep. And uh, I will put, start with Cliff. And Cliff, I don't mean to kind of put you on the spot here, but um, Susie told me you had um, previously raised your hand and uh, oh. perhaps wanted to um, ask questions or make some comments. Um, maybe we can start with you and then any um, other audience, feel free to unmute yourself uh, if you would like to have a direct conversation. Uh, great, thanks, um, Susie. I, yeah, for Jeep, I just, my question was you early on, you said, said that uh, unlike uh, in Silicon Valley, startups and other companies really need to have a government connection. So my question really is, what if a, a startup, and I've invested in one that, that didn't have a government connection, what's the best way for them to achieve one and how do they get traction without a, a government connection? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by the government connection is the government support in terms of the policy. Um, and, uh, you know, so let me give you a specific example. Uh, I talk specifically, you know, to um, incubation programs, um, say in, in Thailand. And, you know, I wonder why there aren't a lot of unicorns coming out of the country, given that, you know, they have a lot of uh, smart engineers. You know, most, you know, most of them are actually uh, U.S. educated. Um, and yes, they said it's actually the rule of law. And the rule of law is such that, you know, um, there is something called 5149. So if you want to scale the company, you want to raise uh, money from um, private sector, you know, from VC, maybe PE company, or maybe anyone who want to invest. And ultimately, you know, your stake might not, you know, be the majority stake anymore, right? Because you have to give up a certain type of equity. And that barrier, uh, in you know in some cases still exist so how far can you go with your startup company if this is the rule of law so working with the government to really inform the government make the government understand and support them with a policy that sort of relationship is very crucial and things gonna have to change you know and things start to shape and change you know how they can really go um, about it that is the difficulty. So, you know, in some cases, uh, and, and Thailand is not unique, by the way, in some cases, these companies, the startup companies that was born or grown within a country, they have to go out of country, you know, and be uh, relisted, say, in Singapore, um, so that uh, the startup can, um, can grow more um, significantly, you know, without um, the, the burden or the rule of law that kind of hampering them, them down. So um, that has the, that thing that phenomenon has happened a lot. Uh, um, now Singapore and uh, Singapore and Hong Kong um, also had had different dynamics. So they were competing very aggressively. Hong Kong want to attract um, the startup to locate there so that you know they grow. And they also have certain law in terms of how investor can invest in, and whatnot. You know, is a, um, as as we know it. Um, they, they compete so that ultimately the company, uh, when the company is successful, um, it is listed an IPO um, in their stock market. Um, so Singapore and Hong Kong is kind of like going head to head um, and the government in Singapore has a lot of support. You know, I, um, I, you know, I talk to them with really the easiness of how they do business you know, the rent and, and everything and everything so that a company get to locate there. And if they were successful, please IPO here. So different countries actually have different um, uh, relationships and also the influence that they receive from the government and also the influence that they have to make with the government so that the, the law change so the entrepreneur can, can flourish. Great, thank you. Any other people who will have some questions? So um, if nothing, and then Jeep, I have actually a questions of mine. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier about COVID-19 that kind of give you um, some, uh, some restrictions of, you know, traveling back and forth and, and make it a little bit harder to conduct business um, there. What have you seen or have you heard that this may have changed um, the startup's environment focus or the, the for the 
investors that are interested in Southeast Asia or the Southeast Asia investors that are interested in um, investing um, overseas? Um, how have it like kind of changed their focus or um, interest area? I think the most immediate thing that came into my mind is, you know, like any um, investors all around the world, they're way more conservative in terms of making investment in startups anywhere. It's not just in Southeast Asia or in Silicon Valley. So they're a little bit more cautious. Now, if you look into um, the sector um, that is most important on the majority in the economy, and of course, tourism and services, right? Um, those are huge um, uh, in Southeast Asia. So they're, they got hit pretty hard. Um, and it also impacts a large economy as well, not just the immediate investment in the startup or in venture capital fund. Uh, so they were trying to figure out, you know, um, what, what, you know, what to solve the problem at, at hand. So I think these are the two immediate, uh, immediate things that I've, that I've seen. Um, the companies that manage well, they still go forward. You know, um, the company that, that manage well, usually I see, again, you know, the composition of, you know, professional management team, you know, with the family members um, that, you know, they work together and figure out, you know, what were uh, the new business lines that they can create and, you know, I'll push out in the market. And those, uh, I've seen more success and, or, you know, can handle the, the COVID um, period than not. Um, in the long run, I, I still, you know, say, hopefully three, five years from now, I, I, I don't think that they have changed in terms of, you know, the hunger uh, to really, be you know, one of the region, key regions in, um, in the world to get access to technology and create their own successful technology ecosystem. You can witness by the change in Iran regulations that you know, the, the governments uh, try to you know, help them you know, set up business and, and, and in some cases subsidies uh, to help the business grow. Now, having said that, I still also think that you know, you will see, you start to see a lot more entrepreneurs coming into Silicon Valley or in the U.S. Um, this technology or, you know, startup concept is still very new for them. You know, the way that we understand a startup here, um, there is, you know, 20, 30 years uh, behind us. Uh, the need to understand about the ecosystem, uh, about who are the key players, how to make a business successful, and I think they can learn a lot here. And part of it, this is what um, I'm trying to do, which is, you know, bring the startup here and also, you know, transport our technology there. Great. Um, Susie, we are a little bit over time already. How long do we have the Zoom room? Uh, the Zoom is, um, in theory, available indefinitely. I think we had said... <laughs> would be around um, for another 15 minutes and I do believe that Zoom is now allowing people to chat a little more broadly with each other. Yeah. So um, why don't we set the expectation that this will go until quarter past? Okay. Yeah and please um, you know I'm, I'm happy if uh, you would like to uh, ping me offline stay in touch learning more you know deeper about investment opportunities or advisory um, to me, Southeast Asia is, you know, is coming up and it's going to come up really, really fast. Um, I don't think that, you know, any country want to be lag behind in terms of the technology access now that it's in China, um, uh, India and Israel. Um, this is um, the next hop um, for success. So I appreciate your time today. Please stay in touch. How about, how about the in, uh, honesty standard? The um, especially China, um, you know, uh, are they uh, on? Do you do you feel that the society is uh, has a high honesty standard or kind of low honesty standard compared to the U.S. society? Um, can you please say that again? Sorry, um, I think honest. That is so, so how honest uh, are they? Are the societies the people are in China? Um, I think that's where and especially even, interest. Also even in Southeast Asia. Yeah, in your experience. Yeah, so um, the way um, to do business successfully with Southeast Asia is to be very transparent. Um, and, you know, I find um, in most case, in most cases that I've, 
you know, and I met, you know, more than um, 20, uh, com at least company or conglomerate um, and institution, um, they, they do respect the rule of law. And they have heard a lot about China, you know, on how they do business. They definitely um, do not want to, you know, just, you know, copy and, and, and you know, all, all the things that they've heard. They want to make sure that um, they get benefit from it but um, respect international law. That's why when Ting asked about IP, it's actually not really one of the key discussion. The key discussion that they're concerned more about is whether, whether or not they can do it, how fast they can do it. So I think that the focus is, is a, little bit, a, a little bit different from China. However, I, you know, I have to say that they respect chi China a lot. And you know, they see it as a role model in terms of how fast it can improve, you know, um, it, how, um, how people can really grow ecosystem in less than 10 years. And they want to be one of them. So I can probably, um, I have personally, yeah, yeah, I have personally kind of uh, had experience doing, um, you know, dealing with customers and partners around the world as well. I would say, um, in my opinion, the differences um, in the U.S., which is more of, uh, you know, people respect the laws or we respect the consequences of the law. So um, whenever um, something that uh, it is, you know, you're, 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 you're kind of borderline, you touch the legal boundary, then people tend to not want to touch it. Um, and because the people's expectations is the U.S. will Enforce, well, enforce the, the law, and then um, when you are caught, then you would have consequences. So that's kind of what most people's uh, are doing business, kind of like the guideline is. Um, yeah. And whereas I think in the Europe and in Asia, where um, a lot of the, the businesses are not necessarily public business, but, you know, controlled by um, families or um, private um, entities, they respect the relationship a lot more. So if you are being dishonest, then you would also um, damage the relationship and you may never be able to do business with, with them again. So I think in some sense, um, people, um, all kind of value the honesties of and, and the integrities of doing business. Just an enforcement um, may be different in in areas where um, the the governments and the law enforcement are more values and has a stronger um, weight of enforcement. Then that may be something that people may see as, you know, the line. But in other places, when um, even when the law enforcement are not as strong. Um, the relationship aspects will also drive people to want to have integrity in doing business. Any other Thank questions you. or comments? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I heard some questions. Thank, uh, you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Greeny. <laughs> Thank you, <Hi>. Greeny. <laughs> Again, please, you know, feel free to stay in touch. I would love to, you know, um, uh, discuss more um, about this. Um, there is a lot of excitement, um, you know, from, from me and Ting uh, to, to share more um, uh, about the region and about the business, about um, Intel. Um, Intel is definitely very, very strong. Um, the brand, um, you know, the people, um, the reputation. So I would like to keep us going. And if um, there is any way we can stay in touch, I would like to as well. So we have three more minutes. Um, anybody wants to say anything about um, today's topic or even not about today's topic, maybe about something that's happening in the world or that's happening at Intel? Uh, I have a quick question about super apps. Sure. Uh, so, uh, so I wanted to like, I uh, uh, would like to know your thoughts on this whole trend around these new apps, super apps, which is like all inclusive. They have like right from payments through travel mm -hmm. to food in one app. So like Grab, Grab Financial is one example, right? And uh, which has grown in South, Southeast Asia across 10 plus countries in Indonesia. So do you see this trend continuing uh, and new startups raising like uh, these mega rounds of funding? And how do you see this sector going post-COVID? Post 
Yeah. So um, it's interesting. Uh, Grab um, actually took over, kind of acquired um, Uber in the region. So um, mm -hmm. um, they used to be, you know, competitor, but right now there is no competitor. So it's just Grab and there is Gojek, which is similar to Grab, but, you know, um, in Indonesia. And I think, you know, um, uh, Indonesia um, is, is quite um, fascinating um, to me. I mean, Grab is in Singapore, uh, if you don't know, and it's the majority of the um, is a market leader in entire Southeast mm. Asia. Um, so for Gojek, uh, which, you know, um, compete with Grab, but mainly in Indonesia, um, it's growing really strongly. And there are a lot of other companies um, that growing really well as well. And the Indonesian government and the, and the private sector, they have a very strong push for the startup. You know, there are unicorns coming, coming out um, of the, of Indonesia, of the country. You know, I see, I see Indonesia, you know, even new light in the last uh, few years, I have to tell you, I, I'm very impressed. I'm very impressed. You know, there is a fintech company um, that coming out that, you know, um, reaching um, unicorn uh, status very soon, ability to raise money, not just in Southeast Asia itself, but also um, in the US because the investor here see that Southeast Asian market is huge, especially the underbank or unserved um, bank, you know, in a banking population. I don't see they are going to to slow down. I think COVID, you know, is is to a certain extent, you know, um, um, make people rethink a lot um, in terms of how they can solve the the problem um, and you know go through this. But once we coming out of COVID uh, period, I I am really bullish about um, the region, especially around the startup um, in especially in Indonesia that that you mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. There are a lot of there are a lot of other sectors that I think are going to come up. So you have already seen uh, Grab, which is, of course, you know, uh, transportation and, and Gojek. You've seen um, a lot of um, underserved um, um, banking uh, startups. You're going to see a lot as well in healthcare industry. I think this is something that a lot of people have not thought about um, Southeast Asia, which is healthcare system. And in fact, you know, um, in Southeast Asia, it is a uh, there is something called me medical tourism, <laughs> as you may, may, may have heard before, that people just go there to get some sort of surgery, right? Because, because it's cheaper, you can pay out of pocket, the quality is superb. Um, now, you know, as um, the private, uh, private hospitals already kind of, uh, you know, uh, pulled together as one giant conglomerate, I think they're gonna be able to offer more in terms of the effic efficiency and effectiveness. And this is uh, something that, um, uh, I talked to uh, the, you know, some of the CEOs who manage a group of healthcare companies, and I, uh, you know, the, he's going to push very hard. Already start partnering with some of, you know, startups um, in the Bay Area. Um, this, this is uh, a, a nice surprise, I, I, I would say, um, that I witnessed in a, in a country. Good, Maudie, Thanks. Yep. Right. So we're at the 15 past mark. So thank you everybody from joining um, today's uh, event. Susie, do you have any closing remark? Uh, just again, thank you everyone for coming, for your patience with uh, the, the joys of Zoom. This recording will be uh, published, I believe, to the Intel alumni website for certainly the Facebook page probably and again thank you jeep for posting your information for people who had follow-up questions and um to tingwei as well thank you so much thank you thank you appreciate Glad your time to meet you all all right thanks jeep thank you see you then bye, bye.